We're not doing a podcast. The most exciting thing in New York sports this week was the MLB trade deadline as it seems like the worst is yet to come for both the Yankees and Mets. Mark Weber here with Jarrett Least. Jarrett, to start the show, I ask you, between the Yankees and the Mets, who won the trade deadline earlier this week? Well, the answer to the question is who won the trade deadline. It's the Mets because you want to go in one direction or another. You either want to be going for it if you're a team that's in contention. The Yankees didn't do that. Or if you're a team that's in total shambles like the Mets were this year, you might as well just blow the whole damn thing up, which is what they did. The Yankees, they're just in a state of disarray. They don't know what they're trying to do. Whereas you have to at least give credit to the Mets. They acknowledge the fact that this 2023 team wasn't working. Yes, they're going to go down as one of the worst teams in the history of the New York Mets. But they pivoted. They decided we got to jump ship. And with the financial power of Steve Cohen, they were able to absolve a lot of money and ship out Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander and essentially buy legitimately good prospects that helps bolster the Mets farm system. I don't know what you could really say about anything good that the Yankees did because they weren't real, there weren't buyers and they weren't sellers. At least the Mets, they were sellers. I'm gonna go with a hot take here and go against your point and say that the New York Mets lost the trade deadline because they cemented themselves as losers. First off, you came into the season with the highest payroll in baseball. You get two Hall of Fame pitchers last year and this year with Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander. You get rid of them both. Going into the 2021 season, the owner promises that if they don't win a World Series in three to five years, it'll be a major disappointment. Then says, we're we're building the team towards 2025 and 2026. That is a loser franchise filled with loser fans who think that this trade deadline was successful. And I'll tell you why. Prospects are a sham. Prospects are to just sell you on keep buying tickets and keep believing in the team. I don't know how you continue to root for the New York Mets, given this trade deadline, trading six players that were important to this year's team. Granted, the team stunk. The 1992 Mets have been regarded as the worst team that money could buy, but the 2023 Mets have certainly, literally, given them a run for their money, and you got to just feel bad for Mets fans at this point. So why would you hold on to the players? You just said the Mets were one of the worst teams. They did what they had to do, but they cemented themselves as losers. I don't know how you have any hope or optimism that, well, that's your bets going forward that's a totally different conversation the question was who was the winner of the trade deadline the yankees there's no there's they're nothing they didn't do anything the yankees are just stuck in the middle whereas they're not winning a world series this year they're probably not even going to make the playoffs the mets we knew this whole season was a failure at least acknowledge the um, I applaud the Mets for acknowledging the fact that this was an unmitigated disaster. They could have simply said, well, we'll try it again in 2024 with Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander. Max Scherzer, he's washed. The fact that they were able to convince him to waive his no trade clause was a miracle. Kudos to the Mets for they probably lied to Max Scherzer to get him to waive the no trade clause because they probably said to him, oh yes, we're not really going to try to win in 2024. If they're going to actually tell him we're trying to go for it in 2024, then he would have rejected any sort of trade. So, yeah, the Mets probably lied to Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander, but at the end of the day, who cares? Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer are no longer property of the New York Mets. They got good prospects in return. Yes, prospects, you don't know what they're going to become. It ultimately comes down to can the Mets – develop these young players and can and develop a young pipeline of young players where they could continue to bring up young kids and have them grow. But the winner of the 2023 trade deadline is unequivocally the New York Mets. 
That's not to say the Mets are a good franchise. It's a totally different conversation to have. The Mets are a joke. I, I've said this 500 times on the podcast, and we've had, what, maybe 20 episodes? I know the Mets are a joke, but at least they acknowledged they themselves were a joke. I couldn't watch Max Scherzer pitch another inning for the New York Mets. So I'm glad he's gone. Now, as far as Justin Verlander goes, I like the fact that they didn't pull any half measures. If you're just going to don't go half pregnant, you either go all in or you're all out. And the Mets decided they were all out and they have Steve Cohen's money. So we'll see how they reassess things come this off season in the winter. Well, Steve Cohen's money can't solve all the problems as Met fans will not just wait till next year is their official slogan, but now it's wait another few years, which has been the slogan for many years before that. And a lot of Met fans thought the money would solve those issues when the Wilpons sold the team to Steve Cohen. And clearly that is not the case. Now it is very doom and gloom for both the Yankees and Mets. As we've mentioned, Jared, give me one player from the Mets and the Yankees that will make it worth watching and worth getting the cheap tickets for, for the rest of the 2023 season. For the Mets, it's Francisco Alvarez, because he's been by far the best prospect that they've called up a young stud, 21 year old catcher who has looked very good behind the plate. And he's got insane, insanely raw power. He's already got 21 home runs as a rookie catcher, which the most for a rookie, I believe tied with Johnny bench. So He's got a chance to be an absolute superstar. He's someone that you look forward to watching. Hopefully they call Brian Mauricio as well in the coming weeks. And as far as the Yankees go, if Aaron Judge stays healthy, it's Aaron Judge. I mean, who on the Yankees that's a young, exciting player are you really excited to watch? Anthony Volpe has been okay He's been a he's been a guy the Yankee fans have overrated. He's been solid, but he's not been great. As far as someone you're looking forward to watch on the Yankees, I just feel at this point it's only Aaron Judge. If he stays healthy, there's just really not much else. Maybe you could continue to watch Garrett Cole go on his path to winning the American League Cy Young. That looks in all likelihood going to happen. So that gives the Yankees fans something to watch each time Garrett Cole makes his starts every fifth day winning the Cy Young which I don't believe a Yankee has won the Cy Young in over 20 years since Roger Clemens won it in 2001 or something like that so there's really not much there's nothing at this point when it comes to excitement with both New York baseball teams which is why I'm wearing a jet shirt because let's just end the baseball seasons at this point both let's go happy. on to another franchise. That both are miserable. They're both well. miserable this summer. It's just, it's really just been absolutely painful. It's been painful. Well, at least the weather has been nice and hasn't rained too much, but instead of <laughs> enjoying the sun a lot, people have been stuck watching Yankees and Mets games and just being tortured to by their ownership. I'm going to go with two easy answers for both teams. For the Yankees, it is 100% Garrett Cole. Aaron Judge is a really fun player to watch, obviously. If you're a young fan, He's the franchise. He's the captain. He's going to be there for quite some time. But we don't necessarily know how Judge will be from a health standpoint for the rest of the season. So the answer has to be Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole is the only reason you should ever purchase tickets to a Yankee game unless the tickets are incredibly dirt cheap. As you mentioned, potentially the first Cy Young winner since Roger Clements in 2001. That was my first full year watching the Yankees. So I thought the Yankees were always going to have a Cy Young candidate and always have a Cy Young winner. Garrett Cole has been a candidate in the last few years. Luis Severino had that great first half of the 2018 season, but it hasn't happened since 2001, as you mentioned. So if Garrett Cole could do that and Garrett Cole could continue to live up to his contract that no one is giving him credit for, he is absolutely the reason why Dan should be watching the Yankees. For the Mets, I'm going to go with another pitcher who people really aren't giving too much credit, and that's their all-star, Kode Senga. Kode Senga is on the team for a few years. Technically, their best rookie pitcher since Doc Gooden. And I think that Kode Senga is a major part for why fans could watch the game. And by the way, Kode Senga, 
Uh, by the way, uh, Kodai Senga is, uh, you know, so he's been the first rookie all-star since Doc Gooden. Now, moving on from there, we talked about the trade deadline, talked about things to look forward to with the Yankees and Mets. Between David Robertson, Justin Verlander, and Max Scherzer, what was the best trade for the New York Mets? Easily Max Scherzer. Just the fact that you got him the fuck out of here. And you got Luis Angel Acuna to top it off. Ronald Acuna's brother. I would have given Max Scherzer away for, for, for anything at this point. He, he was just a disaster of a New York Mets. Yes, when he first came over last year, he got off to a good start the first few months of the season. But every big game this guy pitched in, he was just awful. It started last year when all they had to do was win one game in that final series against the Braves. The Mets win the division. He was awful in that game. Then he gets the ball in game one in the wild card series against the Padres. The game was over before fans even got into their seats at City Field. It was the series was over right then and there when Max Scherzer was dreadful against the Padres. And then this year, between the suspension of the, the sticky stuff and just being totally ineffective, and each time the Mets try to somewhat get back into the thick of things in the race this year, anytime he would be given the ball with a chance to build momentum, he continued to spit the bit. Max Scherzer will go down, in my opinion, as one of the worst Mets free agent signings of all time because you just top – Even though he was pretty good last year yeah, it, and took them to the playoffs? It's – there's so many things when it comes to Max Scherzer and also just the comments that he made after his last star with the Mets. Just at the end of the day, you had everything to do with why this team was an unmitigated disaster this season. And like I just said before, every big game, he was awful. He never could pitch well in a big spot for this team. And it's also predated history. Us Mets fans, we never liked Max Scherzer to begin with because he was always a rival going back to his days with the Washington Nationals. We never liked the guy. And the fact that he comes over to the Mets and is just a meatball machine, giving up home run after home run after home run, he was just awful. So to answer the question, the best trade was getting rid of Max Scherzer because he's gone and you got a legitimate top five prospect in your system now in Luis Angel Acuna. I think the best trade was Justin Verlander. I mean, you're getting two guys that are first round talent. And also I think what's the most surprising is one of the players that they got in that trade, Drew Gilbert was a 2022 first round pick. Now remember the Mets had two first round picks in 2022 between Jet Williams and Kevin Parada. So now you have three first round picks in the 22 draft. Now I know prospects are just a load of, Bull poop and just a load to get the fans excited going forward. But that still is a big deal. And if you have three first round picks, if it's the NFL or the NBA, that gives you legitimate reason to have some optimism. And also Clifford, who they got as well, Ryan Clifford, the outfielder, 11th round pick. And the only reason why he reportedly went in the first round in the 11th round was because he was pretty much a lock to go to Vanderbilt. He hit a home run in his first game for the Brooklyn Cyclones. That, to me, you got some impressive prospects for Justin Verlander. But, again, the Mets have cemented themselves as losers because they're not the franchise that's supposed to be looking at prospects. They should be getting the top free agents. They did. The top players year after year. Prospects is not something that a team with the payroll of the Mets should be focused on. They did, Mark. They did acquired the best free agents and it didn't work. That's why they're pit. That's why they pivoted. How do you have any optimism? They're going to keep trying. They're going to keep trying. How do you have optimism for these prospects? It's a different question. You just said that they should be trying to get the top free agents. They literally just did the past two off seasons. They got Max Scherzer. They got. What could they do is right. What could they do? Right. If they try to reload later, and get Julio Urias. How do you know that he's not going to stink? Like, well, so do you want? So do you want them to just blow up City Field and just cease the franchise? Is I mean, is that is that what you want? I just don't you get them. Mets fans are optimistic. 
I, it's just delusion at this point. Well, it's because we're fans. You, you're, it's, yes. I don't know. I think there's better things to do than watch the Mets baseball after a certain time. I don't know when people. Of course there play. is. Of course there's better things to do than watch the Mets. We're delusional sickos. But that's what we do as Mets fans. We keep watching. It's not a matter of believing. It's, it's People talk themselves into it. But at the end of the day, the Mets will always be in position, now with Steve Cohen as their owner, to be top players in free agency. And if that doesn't work, as they just showed in the trade deadline, they can eat more money, trade away players, and get more prospects. So Steve Cohen can buy players, and he could buy a farm system. You hope over time, all the money spent ultimately results in a World Series championship. It's year three of Steve Cohen. It's not like it's been 15 years of his ownership. It hasn't been great so far, but let's see Let's see what the Steve Cohen ownership looks like five, 10, 15 years from now. Remains to be seen, but there is more reason to be hopeful with the Steve Cohen Mets than the Wilpon Mets. I'll just leave it at that. Moving on to another franchise that always disappoints its fans, and many of them have to wonder why they're not spending their time doing anything else. With the New York Jets, the Football Hall of Fame game is currently on as we're talking right now, which Jarrett is clearly watching in the background, if you haven't noticed. Aaron Rodgers, his biggest moment today was that it was announced that he purchased a house in New Jersey for $9.5 million with a beautiful view of the New York City skyline in Montclair, New Jersey. Jared, if you had Aaron Rodgers' money and you had to live in New Jersey to be close to the practice facility, which is the town that you would pick in the Garden State? Well, not being that familiar with the New Jersey area, maybe, I guess, Livingston or Tenafly. How far is Livingston and Tenafly? Livingston's very close to Florham Park. Don't worry, okay. I Googled that before. So there you go. I mean, I'm sure they've got some nice delis and uh, and good pizza shops and good steakhouses in Livingston, New Jersey. We met some nice people from Livingston, New Jersey in our time in Syracuse. So maybe there, but uh, those would be my answers. Livingston, maybe Tenafly. Um, what are the what are towns that are in, in the New I Jersey? I mean, for me personally, it's two towns you haven't mentioned. I know a lot about New Jersey personally, and I don't know maybe if this was your experience at Sleep Boy Camp, but. My sleep boy camp was pretty much a New Jersey reunion. So I'll tell you this, Alpine and Short Hills. Alpine is like the cream of the crop in New Jersey. It's where CeCe Sabathia lives. I believe Willie Colon lives there. A lot of athletes, current and former, live in Alpine, New Jersey, because it's just beautiful. Hideki Matsui was at the Alpine Country Club with CeCe Sabathia yesterday even. Beautiful place. But as a Jew, for myself, and if I was making Aaron Rodgers money, it would have to be Short Hills. Short Hills is just absolutely beautiful. And you have two train stations that go there between Short Hills and Milburn. Decent ride from the city. Not that far from Florham Park. Has to be Short Hills for me. But if you were Aaron Rodgers and you could pick anywhere in the tri-state area, where would you pick to get a $9.5 million home? Not New York City. That's number one. <laughs> Maybe somewhere in the suburbs, somewhere out on Long Island. Uh, maybe got to be somewhere out east in the Hamptons, potentially, even though that that's a long commute. If Oh, you would do that. You would have a helicopter if you had that type of money to drop you off at MetLife Stadium before every Sunday. Oh, you would 100% get Blade or like Blade Plus just to bring you into MetLife. Well, just going back to our last segment, going over the Steve Cohen Mets, if anybody who watched Billings in the past, Bobby Axelrod, he would just take a helicopter to his to his kids' uh, baseball game. So yes, that sort of that sort of thing. But uh, I don't know, maybe definitely definitely the suburbs. That's for sure. Whether it's a nice town in Connecticut or somewhere on Long Island, Westchester, somewhere in New Jersey, potentially. Definitely not New York City, as I'm as I'm doing the podcast. In uh, my nice apartment in in New York City currently, the level humble of the humble city that we live in. Yeah, I think if city. you're Aaron Rodgers and you're emphasizing the New York City skyline as a Long Islander myself, Sands Point would have to be the option right there. Probably a tough commute to get from Sands Point to MetLife Stadium, even on the basis and to Florham Park. 
daily him for buying, practice. Him buying the house, though, does show he's committed to the New York Jets for the foreseeable he future. He has real estate everywhere. He has real estate in Tennessee. He has real estate in California. When you have as much money as him, that's easy to do with your money. He's committed, though. I think he's committed. I don't know about that. I mean, it's like he's not really committed to Tennessee, and he has a house there. So I wouldn't really say he is show his, he is committed, but it shows that New Jersey real estate's a good investment, and I'm sure that he had the right people telling him that. Now, we talked about a lot of changes in sports, especially with the New York Mets and the trade deadline. But one major change in sports that has been getting a little bit of pizzazz, but not too much pizzazz, and it deserves to get a lot more pizzazz considering the amount of time viewers have spent with them, is the change that we're seeing with the NBA broadcast. ESPN slash ABC has replaced Mark Jackson and Jeff Van Gundy with Doris Burke and Doc Rivers. Mike Breen will be staying as the play-by-play guy. Jared, do you think this makes it better or worse? having Doris Burke and Doc Rivers in the booth with Mike Green. Well, the booth of Mike Green, Jeff Van Gundy, and Mark Jackson was probably the best national broadcast booth in sports, honestly. They, they just The three of them had such great chemistry together. And my theory on why Jeff Van Gundy was let go is this had everything to do with the NBA, not liking the fact that Jeff Van Gundy has been so openly critical of the current state of the league just with flopping and all sorts of reasons to be critical of the league, rightfully so. But the fact that you still have Mike Breen being the lead voice, he'll be able to make it work with Doc Rivers and Doris Burke. I don't love Doris Burke's style of broadcasting. I'm just not the, I'm just not the biggest fan of her. Why Uh, why is that Jared? Why aren't you the biggest fan of Doris Burke? I just, she just, I don't know. She's just too, just is that energetic. why you didn't see the Barbie movie? Is, there, that? is there a connection? No, it has nothing to do with why I didn't see the Barbie movie. Just, this, I'm just not a fan of just the way oh, she's acting and O's when it comes to her. I just, I'm just not a fan of her style. I'm just not a fan of Doris Burke's style at all. If you want to if you want to accuse me of whatever, I, I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. But uh, I'm just not a fan of Doris Burke's broadcasting. But And Doc Rivers, I don't think he's going to be all that good because, quite frankly... Does he even have that great of a broadcasting voice? A little bit of a raspy voice. I, I don't know, but it's well, he did have throat cancer years ago. But before that, when he was a broadcaster with TNT in the 90s and then did the 2004 NBA Finals with Al Michaels, he was known as one of the great color commentators of the last couple of years. People really loved Doc Rivers when he was a color commentator. Now, granted, it's gonna be different with the state of his voice, but if he could provide a lot of value, that'd be great. And I'll say this, and this is a humongous spicy picante hot take. I think this is a better booth. Doris Burke, I think she's fine. She's done the NBA Finals for years. She's been doing the sidelines since about 2009 with Mike Breen. As long as you have Mike Breen in there, you're great. I just was never a fan of Van Gundy and Mark Jackson. Mark Jackson, I thought, just brought absolutely nothing except for when he do the mama, man down, man there down. goes that man. Hand down, man down. Aside from those catchphrases going into the commercials, really didn't bring a lot. And Jeff Van Gundy was brutal, brutal to listen to in the last two minutes of a game. When he would be complaining about the refs, the fouls. No one He's wanted right. to hear that. He's right. A, a, a lot of people. So many people wanted to hear that because so many people hate the NBA. It's, that's why the NBA. But I love the NBA. I want to watch the game. I you want to hear some the analysis of the game. I don't want to hear analysis of the refs. I don't want to hear Jeff Van Gundy lecture about the rule book during a NBA finals game that's ending at 1130 at night. It puts me to sleep. I always have to shut it off because I couldn't listen to the guy. Speaking, Jeff Van Gundy is speaking to the majority, in my opinion, because people people hate the NBA. People hate the so cards. they watch it, Jared? What's that? And why do they watch it? Be, well, because if it's the NBA Finals, I guess people will tune in. But it's the NBA. The NBA, in terms of just the quality of the league, is the worst of the four. And I give credit to Jeff Van Gundy being so openly critical of it. The NBA just absolutely sucks. It sucks. It's a terrible league. And Jeff Van Gundy's right to be critical about it. The fact that stars with stars requesting trades, it's a totally different topic of conversation. But Jeff Van Gunny has every right to be so openly critical of the NBA because 
It's just not a good league. The only great time of the year during the NBA is when July 1st free agency hits. That's it. When the season starts, there's there's no juice. There's nothing to the NBA. It's just not good. I'm glad the Knicks are good now, which is which is great, but that's just me as a Knicks fan. The NBA as a whole, it just isn't good. It's not good. And Jeff Van Gundy has a right to be critical about it. So I'm going to miss Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson. But All right, well, we wish the best to Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson, their families, so I'm sure they're dealing with a lot that, hey, they were doing NBA Finals series since 2014, and before that, from 2007 to 2011. Of course, that break where Mark Jackson wasn't on the broadcast was when he was the head coach of the Warriors, and they went right back to doing the NBA Finals broadcast right after being terminated with his role at Golden State when the Warriors hired Steve Kerr and begun their dynasty. Speaking of entertainment, one thing that Jarrett may find more entertaining than the NBA anything is Cardi B concerts. Cardi B recently threw a microphone at a fan after a fan threw a drink at her. That microphone went on eBay, started at $500. As of earlier today, it is getting bids of $99,000. Every penny supposedly going to charity, one specializing in special needs kids in Las Vegas, and another for the Wounded Warrior Project. Very admirable charitable projects. Jared, would you ever want Cardi B's microphone that she threw at a fan? No, I wouldn't want the microphone that she threw at the fan, but kudos to her for throwing the thing at the fan. Quite frankly, the state of society in 2023 is just so upside down. The fact that people think they have the right when they go to concerts to just throw stuff on stage. You saw this at a, a BB Rexa concert several months ago where someone threw a phone at her where it gave her a black eye. Honestly, BB Rexa. You're a BB the, Rexa fan? I, you know, the song I'm Good, which is probably the most popular song over the past several months. You know that song. I have no idea what you're talking about. You you know the song you've heard. I might it. have heard it, but I, I wouldn't hear it and go, BB Rexa, that's you, her. You, you, well, because it's the most popular song that's been out there for the past seven, eight months. That people know who she, she performed during the halftime show, one of the Thanksgiving Day football games. Uh, for the for the Lions game, I believe. But going back to that, it's people have just lost their minds. People they think just they just have the right. If you pay money to go to a concert, you could just throw something at the performer. Quite frankly, if that was me, I would have I would have run into the I would have run into the audience and probably knocked the person out. Honestly, I would have pulled the Ron Artest. I would have pulled I would have pulled a mouse at the palace. One hundred percent. I would have been like, you know what? You're paying to see me. You're not going to throw shit on the stage at me. And if you mess with my stage, I'm coming at you and you're going to pay the goddamn price. So kudos to Cardi B throwing the damn microphone at the person. I hope it hit the person in the face and knocked him the hell out, honestly. I think they're threatening to uh, press charges against her, too. Well, look, I think they were dropped. I think they were dropped. I saw a recent. I, I saw an article a few hours ago. So and they should be dropped. And I'm not the biggest fan of Cardi B. I think some of her music's way too inappropriate. I mean, it's just very not kid friendly. Some of her music. I mean, I, I say whatever I want in this podcast, and I won't even say some of the things that she says in some of her songs. So, but kudos to her. She lost. She was preparing for that concert. Someone gets in her way. You throw that damn microphone at that person, and you tell them, "Not on my watch." So, but I'm not going to pay for the microphone. Who needs that? Going off on that, Jarrett with some passionate takes on Cardi B. And society. People want more passionate takes from Jarrett. Thus being said, Jarrett, you went to the movies for the first time since December 2018. (laughs) There's Uh, pre-COVID and then there's that. uh, Jarrett, oh boy. What have you been doing? 2019 had some good movies. Other uh, than that, your first movie you've seen since then, Oppenheimer, was with me at the Orpheum in the Upper East Side of New York City. Yes. Let me get two of your thoughts, Jared. Give me your review of the movie and the theater experience uh, itself. Okay. The, the, the better answer I will give second. So the movie review Oppenheimer was fantastic. If you're interested in history, you should go see it. It is a little long, so... A little long. 
prepare yourself. It's three hours. Prepare yourself. But if you're intrigued by history, go watch it. And if you don't know the full story of Oppenheimer, you'll definitely want to read up about it after you see the movie. Now, getting to the movie theater experience. My goodness. We went to go see the movie. The showtime was at six o'clock, right? Six o'clock, right? Correct? Yes. I get it. It starts at 6.15 because of all the previews, coming yes. attractions, everything. Yes. Were there people first walking in to the movie theater at around 7.30? 7 7 7.30, Jared. There were, people like walking in, there were people walking into the movie theater with a fresh bag of popcorn who I did not see walk in at first at 7.15 at 7.30. What are you doing? Like, I, I, like, what are you doing? I, if you got, if you're gonna be late, then just then don't go to the movie. And then, quite frankly, I it's a three hour movie, so I understand that people have to go to the bathroom. People got up and out of their seats four or five different times during the movie to go to the bathroom. I had to go an hour and a half in, but you know what? I held it in. Paid to go see a movie at a movie theater. I'm gonna sit through the whole damn thing and watch it. And this it was a great movie theater, but quite frankly, this movie theater looked like it was built in 1912. So it was a good experience, but uh, going to a movie theater, you get the real, real people experience. And quite frankly, I just don't like it. I'm quite frankly done with people. I'm done with most people. So which people are worse? Those who go to a Cardi B concert in Las Vegas, or those who go to a movie theater in New York City? Oh, movie theater. Uh, huh. They didn't Probably. throw microphones at the screen or anything like I that. Mean, the, 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 I mean, the quality of that. I mean, that's the worst quality. I mean, the girl next to me was on her phone, was taking pictures of the screen, and then yeah. halfway through, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, people are just, that's just like even going back to the Cardi B conversation, like the state of society in 2023 is just so off the rails. Honestly, I, that, there's a reason why so many people take take drugs and take Xanax and all this other sort of shit to just calm themselves down, honestly. People are just so goddamn demented. Uh, it's just ridiculous. I had a, I had a great time with you, but moving forward, I'm going to watch movie theaters at home when it comes when it comes out available, where I can just watch it in the comfort of my home. It's ridiculous, but uh, you're that dag, That is why the streaming wars are winning because Jarrett Lee could not go to the movie theaters. On that note, we're not doing a podcast. Mark Weber here with Jarrett Lee. Hopefully, I don't have to talk about Kodai Senga again in the near future unless he pulls an NL Rookie of the Year candidacy because I completely blanked after talking about him. I think I was going to bring a stab at Francisco Alvarez, but it has been a long day for me. Not an excuse. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night, everybody.